So we welcome Professor Nat Gobal Sami. Sir, we welcome you, sir. We'll be starting the meeting in another seven minutes' time, sir. So we request. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, no problem. It's only uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, so 6.53. Okay, okay. So you are at uh, Atlantic Ocean side or Pacific Ocean side? Uh, Atlantic. Okay. It is, uh, East Coast. East Coast, yes. yeah. Yes. So uh, this is uh, your, your summer is started. You have... Uh, Vacation period now, or how is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Our vacation is almost over. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so from next week onwards, our college will start. Okay. So since this is coronavirus lockdown, we'll be starting. Okay. Uh, we'll be starting uh, on online only. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, everybody is online. So you are doing from your home or office? Now I am at office. Okay. My home, my home is very, very near to the college. Okay. So I am allowed to come. Very good. So uh, how many people are expected to attend? Uh, sir, so far, uh, 1,900 people have registered. Uh -huh. Okay, we are, sir. At we least... are expecting at least... 700 uh, to 800 people to attend this meeting, sir. Oh, my goodness. That's a big, uh, big meeting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, this is, uh, you said, applied physics? Uh, we have Department of Applied Physics. Mm -hmm. we, have, we are offering uh, optometry course also, BSc optometry, BSc physics, and MSc physics, sir. Okay. And then PhD program in physics. Okay. So who was your advisor in, uh, you said you uh, finished your PhD in uh, Bardiar University? Yes, sir. That's correct, sir. And who was your advisor? My advisor was Dr. S. Selva Sekhara Pandian. Okay. I think okay. I met him, yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. So you're from uh, which Uttar Pradesh? 
no 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 sir i am from tamil nadu down south mm. in tamil nadu but your name is khanna khanna yes, is sir, a sir. Uh, cast cast name from north india that's correct sir uh, somehow my <laughs> parents name me like that oh okay okay of course yeah <laughs> okay tamil theriyuma pa ha tamil theriyum sir na tamil nadu sir now நான் ஒரு நார்த் இந்தியன் பரவாயில்ல தமிழ் தெரியாதுன்னு நினைச்சிட்டு தான் நான் இவ்வளவு நேரம் இங்கிலீஷ்ல பேசிட்டு இருந்தேன் ஏமாந்துட்டு இருக்கிறோம் Mm-hmm. And he asked my name when I said Khanna with a H between he really hugged me. Oh, Punjabi! <laughs> I told him, no, no, I am uh, I'm from Dajin Bharat. I am from South India. I told him. Hey, in our country, we have to say Sokalal Ramsayad Bidi. We have to say Sokalal Ramsayad Bidi. உரையாடலுக்கு பயன்படுது So now it is morning time at uh, your place, sir? Correct. Oh, okay. okay. How 7 is the... o'clock in the morning. Okay, fine. How is the coronavirus situation in your place? Is it okay? Uh, here it is subsided. We have uh, all... Most people are uh, vaccinated. Okay, fine. fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, in some states, uh, there are people who... who you know we have all, always uh, in every country we have some uh, group of people who do not believe in these kind of things so they don't want to get vaccinated so because of them other people are at risk oh okay okay uh, but uh, every country has a small population like that so oh okay it's a free country so they can believe in whatever they want but the yeah, only problem is it affects other people yeah uh but overall i think uh, we have uh, 50% of the people vaccinated okay fine and uh, maybe uh, fully vaccinated maybe another uh, 5 6% vaccinated double dose both doses a okay. single dose is another 5% so overall about a uh, little more than half the people are completely vaccinated oh fine so fine fine so we will start the program now over to okay. mcs so we have a couple of very eager uh, students who wanted to become the master of ceremony for this webinar so i hand over the session to anisha maharana thank you sir good evening everyone i am anisha maharana second year bsc optometry student at karunya institute of technology and sciences As we all know that the world is going through a tough time due to pandemic covid this pandemic is having a major impact on the future of young adults not just from the virus itself but because of its impacts on the economy employment education and overall health system despite the challenging circumstances we somehow managed to keep ourselves safe and healthy Although we can't meet in person due to social distancing but thanks to the developing technology that today we are united here virtually for this webinar so it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of our institute to welcome you all here today it gives me immense 
warmth and great pleasure to grace all of your presence in the interest of the entire community. It gives me tremendous contentment to be presenting the welcome speech amongst the most esteemed personalities. We are grinning to welcome all the delegates, scientists, scholars, professors, and students from all around the globe to take part in this webinar, to witness precious scientific discussions, and bestow to the future improvement in the field of astronomy, astrophysics, and space science. Now, without taking much time, Jayashree, to take the event further. Over to you, Jayashree. Hello, sir. Could you please start the recording? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll start the recording. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Prayer is an action. It is the process of talking with God with energy in order to achieve a purpose. So. Let us begin this inaugural ceremony by seeking the blessings of the Lord Almighty with a prayer. Now I request Ms. Caroline R.J., second year, MSc Physics Department, to grace the occasion with prayer. Let us pray. Our dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings that we have, that you have bestowed upon us, and, and we are truly grateful uh -huh. for Thank you for all the blessings and allowing us to meet today virtually through this webinar. And may you, may you extend your divine wisdom to us, chief guests who are going to share his knowledge by the God-given knowledge. And may you continue to bless him with, with good health and, and also bless the participants to blend the vital information and spread out and spread out and share the knowledge to the to this world and we ask this in the name of our lord jesus christ amen thank you miss garland for such a soul warming prayer a warm and sincere welcome gives a sense of caring and makes people feel appreciated as well as making them feel that they have made a good choice in using a business in preference to others now I request Dr. S. Rajis, Professor Anhe, Department of Applied Physics, to welcome the gathering. Sir, please. A very good evening and uh, a very good morning to Professor Gopal Swami. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Applied Physics, Karanya Institute of Technology and Sciences, I'll, I welcome uh, Dr. Gopal Swami for this uh, webinar series. And uh, I also welcome the participants from various parts of the country, as well as from various parts of uh, the world, I suppose. Uh, I thank you one and all for actively participating in the uh, seminar conducted for the past uh, uh, one week in different uh, areas. And now we have started with the astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, thank you very much for all of you to join for this webinar series. I once again welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Indian hospitality culture is one of the most significant characteristics of India. People in India pay the highest regard to the guest and value hospitality. In fact, Indians live by the popular saying, Atiti Devo Bhava, which means that the guest is God's own reflection. So now I request Mr. Karthik, second year MSc Physics Department, to introduce our honorable guest. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning to Professor Dr. Nachamuthu Gopal Swami. Dr. Nachamuthu Gopal Swami is an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space, Space Flight Center. He has authored or co authored more than 400 scientific articles and has edited nine books. He is the executive director of the International Space Weather Initiative, ISWI. He, ha he has an employment history, uh, a lot of employment history, including NASA's Goddard Place Space Flight Center Greenbelt uh, from 2002 to at present as an astrophysicist. He has completed a BSc and MSc degree from the PSG College of Arts and Science, 
and uh, University of Madras. He has completed his PhD in physics at the Indian Institute of Science in 1982. And he has completed his postdoctoral training at the University of Maryland College Park in 1985. He has a lot of uh, research experiences. He has developed uh, new technologies for simplified coronagraph and polarization de detector that were recently demonstrated using his stratospheric balloon platform BITSE, which is balloon bond investigation of temperature and speed of electrons in the corona. He has studied the relation between solar sustained gamma ray emission detected by the Fermi mission and its physical connection to coronal mass ejections and interplanetary radio bursts. He has also studied radio emission from the sun using the Clark Lake multi-frequency radiograph, ra radio heliograph, the very large array, the Nobema radio, radio heliograph, then the Nanke radio heliograph to understand solar eruptions and particle acceleration. He has been leading a group of half a dozen researchers and supporting them using computer funds for the past 20 years. He has been honored with a lot of awards, including the fellow of the National Fellow of the Science and Technology Agency of Japan in 1996, as a senior research associate with the U US National Academy of Sciences in 1998 to 2000, NASA GSFC National Resource Group Achievement Award in 2000, NASA GSFC Solar System Exploration Division Peer Award in 2006, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center Special Act Award in recognition of superior service in 2006, and many more. He is uh, the member of uh, so many premier unions, including American Geophysical Union, American Astronomical Society, AAS Solar Physics Division, Asia Oceania Geosciences Society, and many more. He has serviced and currently servicing to the community through his committee work, advisory boards, except boards, such etc., such as the member of NASA's Living with a Star Science Definition Team, Associate Editor of Journal of Geophysical Research Space Physics from 2000 to 2006, as a scientific editor of Sun and Geosphere from 2006 to at present. He is also a member of NASA's Sun Solar System Connection Roadmap Committee in 2005. He is a director of International Coordination, uh, International Space Weather Initiative. He is the leader of, uh, he was the leader of NASA's outreach team to Malacca Planetarium and Coimbatore Space Festival. He has also participated in external review of international research institutions. He has directed several international space science symbols for graduate students and postdocs since 2007 in Brazil, China, India, Slovakia, Egypt, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Indonesia, Kenya, Peru, and Azerbaijan. Uh, it was a very warm uh, and a, a honor to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Nachimutu Gopal Swami. Uh, he has never hesitated to uh, give his lectures whenever he come to, comes to an, India. And he has also stayed in uh, Kodekanal Space uh, Solar observatory before the corona pandemic, which is uh, from before uh, January of uh, 2020. It is a, it has been, a, it is my big pleasure, humble pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Nachimutu Gopal Sami. Welcome, sir. Over to the MCs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kartik. Now, moving on to the next session. Scientists have combined NASA data and cutting edge image processing to gain new insight into the solar structures that create the sun's flow of high speed solar wind, detailed in new research published today in the Astrophysical Journal. This first look at relatively small features dubbed plumless could help scientists understand how and why disturbances form in the solar wind. Okay, Amini, let our honorable guest speaker to present his ideas and viewpoint over the topic. Sir, please. Thank you, everybody. I'm uh, really happy to talk to you this morning, uh, for you this evening. Um, 
So uh, when uh, Dr. Khanna approached me to give a talk, I readily accepted and he suggested that I talk about the sun. Of course, uh, my field of research is uh, mainly on the sun. So uh, I'll be happy to talk about the sun. I heard um, uh, from Dr. Khanna that there are a lot of uh, undergraduate students and master's students in addition to faculty members. So I. Uh, I just made my talk uh, at a popular level, so to just impart the main ideas. Uh, so, uh, of course, if you have uh, questions, you can uh, interrupt me within the time available or, or also uh, write down your questions and ask me at the end. And if there is not enough time, you can send me an email. I'll respond to you. Okay, so let me share my screen so that uh, I can... Uh, Proceed with my talk. Uh, I think you have to enable me to share my screen. Sir, you are co-host, so I think you can you can share screen, sir. Uh, but you are enabled, sir. You are but enabled. Uh, the share screen, the share screen. Uh, is it your personal meeting room? Yes, sir, yes, sir. No, that, uh, yeah, I'm not able to share my screen. One minute, sir, one minute. <laughs> okay, I think, oh. let me, uh, Okay, now it looks like I can start. Sir, you have to unmute. So please unmute yourself. Sir, you have to unmute yourself, please. All right, you got it. Yes, so sir. for some reason, uh, the the symbol they didn't work. So I had you had to send me a separate uh, link. Looks like okay. Um, now let me see. Do you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are able to see. Fine, sir. Fine. Okay. Perfect. All right. So. You know, the title is very simple, The Sun. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's everybody knows the sun. Uh, therefore, it's very um, easy to tell you uh, about the sun. But I'm going to talk about three main points. Uh, the first short point is about the sun's prime place in cultures. Uh, you know, everywhere you go, uh, all cultures uh, revered sun as one of the important uh, objects in their life. Most people think it is um, it's God because uh, of uh, the benevolent nature of uh, the sun. Without the sun, of course, no life on earth. And therefore, uh, there is uh, perfectly uh, reasonable that uh, people assumed sun is a God. And I will make a small connection to sun in the universe uh, because... Uh, you know, sun is one of the astrophysical objects, the closest object that we can study in great detail. Um, sun is a star and a part of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy is one of the billions of galaxies uh, in the known universe. And then uh, the third point will be uh, sun's impact on Earth and the impact by, you know, we all know that because of the sun, we get our food and fuel. Uh, and then uh, that is uh, ordinarily we, we know everybody knows because only when the sun shines you can uh, plant you can plant seeds and then that grows and provide food. Uh, but that's because of the uh, heat and light that is sent out by the sun. But there are other things from the sun which are not visible to us in the form of plasma, 
in the form of uh, magnetic field and disturbances uh, coming out of the sun and then impacting Earth and other planets and even interplanetary travel by uh, astronauts. So I will spend a little bit longer on that part. So first coming to the uh, cultural aspects. And you know, uh, everybody uh, uh, has written about the sun. For example, uh, about 2,000 years ago, uh, a Keralite uh, prince by name Ilango wrote uh, a po poetry, Salapadigaram. And in that, in the beginning, uh, he writes, Nyayuru potrudum, Nyayuru potrudum, Kaviri nadan, Tigri bol, Putko to Mela, Meru, Valam, Varadalan, in the Sulgiran. Allow the Nyayere Mukiamana or or uh, Walter Korea or uh, or uh, object Taha Katagra. Ade Bola Ade and the Torachiaha and the culture in Rum uh, Valangagra, the Surian Pongal and Rupongal Nal Galile, uh, Surian Kaha or Pongal Vait. Uh, uh, so you can actually watch a YouTube video about how to draw this column based on uh, uh, based on uh, the Pongal festival in Andhra. And you can clearly see the top position given to the sun. And he said actually thanksgiving to the sun for the uh, uh, for the benevolence of, uh, of the sun. And then if you look at uh, in uh, the uh, American continent, uh, the Inca Indians in uh, in South America, they have uh, a symbol which is the uh, it's called Inti. It is a sun sun god for the um, Inca people, and of course uh, Surya is the uh, sun god in India. And uh, this is a common symbol that I have shown here. And uh, even um, maybe three thousand years ago, uh, the Egyptians uh, had a sun god by name Ra. And uh, the sun god is uh, pictured as, uh, you know, a, a globe with a, a cobra surrounding it. And, uh, and that's also circular with a, with a cobra and its tail pointing from the, from the sun, if you can see here. And people think that this is probably because they observed a solar eclipse. And often during solar eclipse, you can see uh, features like this, which are known as solar prominences. And of course, at that time, they did not uh, have enough knowledge about uh, the sun. So whatever they observed, they tried to interpret. And uh, they interpreted that it's a cobra that is uh, surrounding, the, surrounding the sun. And then uh, you all know about the Greek god Helios. And all of this, if you see, they, they are basically based on what they observe visually, they observe the sun. And based on that, they designed or uh, imagined the uh, face of uh, the sun god. But there are also some cultures in which the sun is not a male, it's a female. Very interesting uh, cultures. Uh, one is the, in Finland, uh, the uh, sun god is called uh, Paivatar. And uh, that is a, a female goddess. And similarly, the Japanese Amaterasu is also uh, a sun god, a sun goddess. And uh, look at the way she is holding the hand, and try to do that because it's a little bit difficult. Not everybody can do this. Uh, holding the uh, the, the uh, ring finger and the middle finger together. And then uh, the Syrian uh, Hittite goddess is Arena and she even has a baby on her lap. So I think the, the main thing is uh, the mythologies are built uh, based on, on the benevolent nature of, uh, of the sun. So, and similarly, uh, in Tamil, there are so many words to describe the sun, which shows, the, again, the importance of, uh, of the sun. Uh, it has got both uh, uh, the name for with a reason and name that is uh, the reason is lost that is iduguri payer and karana payer for example the prime name which as i mentioned is nyayir uh, which is also used as a sunday sun's day nyayir and in malayalam it's nyayir 
And L is another word which is used in uh, uh, Tamil literature as well as commonly in Telugu. It's called L. And uh, you, some of you may know there is a song by Andal which says, Ella ilangiliye innum murangudiyo. And in that LA is uh, means addressing uh, a, a girl as a, as a sun, rising sun. And also there is a time in Tamil literature uh, which is called Ed Party. That means El Party. Uh, that means sundown sun time is used as uh, commonly used. And then you all know Poludu. Poludu is, uh, is also sun as well as a mark of time. And uh, for example, Coimbatore, you will probably hear people, Poludu Galamba Poite, Poludu Vulgurkula Vandre. So you, you know that Poludu means time as well as sun. And the same word is in Telugu as Poddu and in Kannada as Hotu. Uh, this is very common uh, names in these languages. And also in Tamil, we use Suryan, which is a uh, uh, adaptation from Sanskrit to Surya. And names like uh, Pagalavan, Kadiravan, Kadiron, Vayilon, Paridi, Tigri, all these names are uh, based on uh, the effect of the sun. Like Pagal is daytime, and the person making the day is, is the sun. Kadiravan because of the rays coming from the sun, Kadir, uh, and same as Kadiron. And Vayilon because sun produces the uh, uh, heat that we see, we face. And Paridi comes from the circular nature. And the Tihiri comes from the rotating nature. It's same, it is related to Tirugu. So uh, this uh, tells you that people have observed the sun and uh, formed their ideas about the sun for a long, long time, thousands of years. But anyway, so now we, we know the sun is uh, basically a gas of uh, hydrogen and helium. Uh, it has got some interesting magnetic field distribution. And all the properties we see are basically based on uh, the burning of uh, hydrogen gas to produce the heat, uh, burning in the sense of a thermonuclear reaction. And uh, the magnetic field is generated in the outer layer of the sun, about uh, one third from the surface deeper inside. And that magnetic field is what is causing all the disturbances uh, in the interplanetary medium uh, I was mentioning in the beginning. So uh, you all know this uh, uh, basic fact that uh, the sun is a central star. It has got uh, uh, eight planets around it. It, it used to be nine planets, uh, including Pluto, but now Pluto is uh, kind of demoted as a dwarf planet. So we have only uh, eight planets uh, that are official. So you have the four inner planets, which are uh, rocky, and then uh, the four outer planets, which are gaseous. And uh, there is a comparison uh, of the sun with uh, another, another uh, mist star, which is called a brown dwarf, which also has uh, some planets around it. This sun, this brown dwarf doesn't have uh, enough mass to ignite thermonuclear reaction, so it never became, um, became a full star. And uh, such brown dwarfs are cool, uh, 24 degrees, 2400 degrees Kelvin, compared to uh, the sun, which is about uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin. So, uh, so this type of con configuration of the central star with the uh, planets going around, is not uh, only uh, for our sun. Uh, NASA's Kepler mission has uh, identified thousands of uh, such uh, planets uh, around other stars. That means uh, our sun is nothing special. It is, uh, it is one of the many, many stars in our galaxies. In our galaxies is the Milky Way. And uh, uh, scientists have come to the conclusion that uh, uh, the sun is formed out of a gas, and uh, yeah, and then the gas collapsed, so the interior temperature became uh, more than 10 million degrees, and at that temperature, 
uh, you can uh, have uh, protons uh, fuse together uh, to form helium. And in that process, energy is released according to Einstein's uh, energy equals mass times uh, speed of light square. Now, uh, when the sun formed, uh, outer ports of uh, this cloud also condensed to form the planets. So essentially, the sun and the planets have roughly the same age. And the, the cl gas cloud is called solar nebula. Now, uh, I just mentioned that, uh, uh, that sun is a ball of hydrogen gas and uh, uh, it, uh, the fusion thermonuclear reaction is, is what is responsible for the energy. But then uh, we also see trace elements of uh, heavier elements like uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, which is basically important for uh, life on Earth. But these are not from the sun. These are probably from the original nebula uh, that existed there as a, some kind of pollutants uh, from uh, the death of other stars. You know, when you have a massive stars collapse and uh, burn out, then they throw out material, which is, uh, which is much heavier than hydrogen and helium. And that's how you get the gold that uh, our people are wearing on their ears and neck, necks. These are all not from our sun. It is from other stars, the previous generation stars that lived and died and produced these, uh, these heavy elements, again, due to thermonuclear reaction in the interior of those heavy, heavy stars. So here I have shown a comparison of uh, the sun on the left-hand top corner, you can see a sun is a small white dot. And I have shown uh, other stars, for example, Aldebaran, Regal, and Sirius, and, uh, and also Betelgeuse. The Betelgeuse is so large, it is only, I've shown only a sector of the, of the star. And this Betelgeuse is uh, the primary star in uh, the Orion constellation shown on the right-hand side. I'm sure all of you have seen overhead this constellation uh, in uh, in your lifetime, sometime or the other. Of course, in cities uh, now, the, it is becoming more and more difficult to see these things because of the light pollution. But uh, I think uh, still you can uh, you see in at least in you know peripheries of cities. So uh, the main point of this slide is to tell you that Sun is a very ordinary star. And uh, there are stars, of course, smaller than the uh, sun. Uh, but uh, stars, uh, there are many stars which are bigger than the sun. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, our uh, uh, Chandrasekhar, who also studied in University of Madras, uh, he discovered that if, the, if a star has a mass more than about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, then uh, those stars will become some interesting objects when they die. Uh, if the mass is few times the sun, it becomes what is known as a neutron star. If the mass is uh, 10 times or more, then it becomes uh, some, what is known as a black hole. But the sun itself will not become any of these because its mass is uh, you know, one, solar, one solar mass. So it is going to become a, what is known as a white dwarf. Uh, white dwarf is uh, is the end product of uh, our sun, and that will happen about 4.5 billion years from now, which is roughly the time it has lived so far. So the total life of our sun is about 9 billion years, and it has lived half of its life, so it's a middle-aged uh, sun. And uh, it is going to uh, keep our, support our life for maybe another half of another 4 billion years. But then eventually it will become uh, uh, a go through a phase known as red giant. It will become huge, and people think that uh, the size of the sun will be so big that it can uh, uh, reach up to uh, the orbit of Earth, which means some of the inner planets will go into the sun, and then uh, uh, you know, and then it will become a white dwarf, very small uh, structure inside the sun, and the rest of the thing will be distributed into the space. Now, of course, uh, you know, you're all young people, you're studying uh, science and technology, 
you will devise ways for uh, humans to migrate to another star, uh, another planet in uh, some other galaxy, or even in our own galaxy to another star. So uh, that is something to you all to think about. Now, this is Milky Way, and even this you can see with the naked eye if uh, you find a dark place. And this is a, it's a part of uh, our galaxy. Of course, we are inside the galaxy. We cannot see the whole galaxy. Think about uh, if you are confined to your own house, you cannot uh, go outside the house, but your windows is open. So you can look through your window and look at other houses, and you can imagine your roof should be like the other roof. Uh, so that's how we infer uh, the structure of uh, our galaxy. And we think that our galaxy will look like a spiral like this. So it has got uh, a central bright uh, region and then surrounded by a spiral structures because most of the galaxies are rotating. And uh, the sun is, uh, is again, not any particular central place in, in our galaxy. Uh, here is a, a, a sketch of uh, our galaxy based on uh, parts of the observation. And you can see the sun is located somewhat in an in a arm, not even on the main spiral arm, but a small uh, extension. It is called Orion Spur. And so sun is located here. And if you look the same uh, circular structure in a in a edge on view, you will see like this in the right hand side, and the central portion is uh, is the galactic center. And people think there is a black hole sitting there, which is uh, three million uh, solar masses. So if you combine three million suns together, and that's the mass of this black hole sitting in the center of our galaxy, and all the stars you are seeing are. Uh, are the stars from our galaxy. Now, uh, it is important to realize that when you go uh, and see in the night sky, all you see is the stars from our galaxy. Uh, but there are, there are billions of galaxies in the universe, but you cannot see them because they are so far away. The only galaxy that we can see with the naked eye is called Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, and that's, uh, that's the nearest uh, uh, galaxy for our uh, Milky Way galaxy. To illustrate uh, how small our sun is compared to the, the galaxy, uh, I have given you an example of uh, rice because you know rice is staple food for us, so it is uh, easy to understand. So if you take one kilogram of rice, it has about 50,000 grains. OK, so you can actually try to do this at home. Uh, you don't have to take one kilogram and start counting. Maybe you can uh, take 10 grams and start counting. And, you will, and then you can multiply it uh, by a factor of 100 to get, uh, to get uh, one kilogram. So of course, it won't be exactly 50,000, maybe plus minus uh, 100 or something like that. So you can count that. And also, it depends upon the thickness of the rice. It depends upon. Uh, whether it's basmati rice or ayaret or you know, punni, depends upon which rice you're counting. But this gives you a rough idea. So if one kilogram of rice has 50,000 grains, then one ton, which is 1,000 kilogram, will have 50 million grains. Right? In Indian uh, count, it is five crores. So in one ton of uh, uh, rice, uh, you will have five crore grains. So if you if you take ten thousand tons, right, which is very common, to, you know, you can probably uh, the all people in Tamil Nadu can consume uh, ten thousand tons probably in two weeks. So it's not big, but the count wise is big. So five hundred billion grains in ten thousand tons. So you can check my calculation. I may be. Um, so if you pile up all the 10,000 tons of rice and pick just one rice grain from that, and that is the sun in the whole pile of uh, stars from our galaxy. Now you can see how tiny it is. And, but even though it is tiny in the galactic scale, but for a human scale, it's very, very important uh, 
star that uh, that supports life on Earth. Here is a, a picture taken by uh, NASA's Hubble telescope. And all the things that you see in this uh, picture, they are not stars. You see their shapes are all fuzzy and irregular. They're all galaxies. OK, this is about, uh, uh, this corresponds to when the universe is about 1 billion years old, how the uh, galaxies are distributed. And each of these galaxies will have hundreds of billions of stars. So the universe is vast and enormous. And uh, even in our own galaxy, uh, there are several hundred million stars, billion stars. So we can expect that life may exist in many of these uh, stars around the, around the stars or even in other galaxies that uh, you are seeing here. So it's vast universe, and, and uh, you can appreciate how big the universe is and how small the sun is. Now, the, the source of energy for the sun is, uh, as I mentioned before, is thermonuclear reaction. So if you start with six protons, protons means basically the nucleus of hydrogen, because hydrogen has one proton inside, right? So uh, for uh, energy purposes, the electron is not important. So we say uh, six protons. If you take, start with six proton, and then uh, due to the interactions I have shown here, you get uh, finally end up in a helium nucleus, which has got two protons and two neutrons. Since uh, protons and neutrons are roughly the same mass, so you can say that uh, from the six protons we started with, four have been trapped in the helium nucleus because, as you know, helium nucleus is very stable. And then uh, two other protons are released back into the gas. So this is the chain called proton-proton chain. In this process, so what is the end product of this process? Two protons and then helium nuclei one helium nucleus. Now, as you know, if you, if you try to measure four protons, and then if you measure the helium nucleus, you will see a difference. The helium nucleus weighs a little bit smaller than four protons, even though it is made of uh, initially with four protons. So what happens? So uh, there is some energy, there's some mass missing, and that mass actually has been converted to energy into what is known as binding energy to keep all these four uh, nucleons together. And the missing mass, as I mentioned, is, uh, is basically the energy. And that energy is, uh, is E equals mc squared, as I, as I mentioned. So that m is the missing mass. And the, the miss, this energy is released in the form of photons or gamma rays in the interior of the sun. And these gamma rays slowly uh, propagate out because they will be reabsorbed and re-emitted. And finally, by the time they come to the surface of the sun, they become uh, uh, photons of much lower energy in the optical wavelength from gamma rays. So you can actually uh, detect both the energy from the sun and also the neutrinos, which are byproducts of uh, these nuclear uh, reactions I've shown on the left. Uh, so uh, these uh, neutrinos now have been observed in uh, a place in Canada known as Sudbury, and they have confirmed that the number of neutrinos expected from this kind of uh, a nuclear reaction is correct. Because we know the size of the sun, as you can measure the uh, you know radius and then calculate the volume, and we we know the temperature inside the sun uh, from uh, a technique known as helioseismology, and then we measure how much energy is radiated by the sun for every second. It is called luminosity. So based on all these uh, measurable quantities, we can establish that thermonuclear reaction is going on inside the sun. 
and that is the energy that we get when we put to grow our plants and that is the energy we feel when it is hot now as i mentioned in the beginning uh, mostly we have hydrogen which is 92% and it started in the uh, big bang of the of the universe and as the universe cooled down uh, material became uh, uh, the energy became material and neutral material is uh, is hydrogen and then a little bit of helium and all the other heavier elements were formed due to star formation process so uh, as as i mentioned we have in our own body all all these elements heavy elements and the metals like copper cobalt iodine chromium nickel vanadium germanium arsenic boron tin selenium rubidium manganese and molybdenum all these metals are present in our body but these did not come from the sun because other storms which are more massive than the sun formed and if you, the sun is more massive it has got more temperature inside so instead of uh, hydrogen burning you can have burning of uh, heavier elements and they produce by fusion even heavier elements and when those stars explode and die uh, that material is dumped into the clouds and that becomes some kind of trace elements or pollutants in the solar nebula when the sun formed it is in the sun it is in the earth and therefore it is in our body too now so the that means the sun is uh, is not the first generation star it has to have you know two, several generations of other stars formed and died before it but i said men i mentioned that sun has lived for 4.5 billion years but the massive stars they do not live that long so they live only a millions of years and between million and billion there is a, a factor of 1000 so there are many generations of heavier stars formed and died and they put the material of heavier elements into the gas cloud mixed in the gas cloud and when that gas cloud forms a sun sun like star then uh, you get all these metals in the in the sun and we can do this you you probably study spectroscopy you can uh, from spectroscopy techniques you can actually find out what kind of gas exists on the sun you can detect all this iron up to iron lines you can de detect and therefore you can infer what fraction of iron is present in the in the sun and uh, in the in this slide i have uh, shown a a massive star and you can see the instead of helium in the core we have iron in the core and then followed by silicon oxygen carbon and this is how the the heavier stars are composed of and then when they explode you get the heav uh, heavier elements mixed in the uh, gas clouds and uh, for all these uh, uh, elements fusion is the fundamental process and uh, as i mentioned hydrogen becomes helium but when you have heavier and heavier elements uh, fuse you get all elements up to iron by this process so when you see an extra iron it's actually remember that it was made not from uh, by, by uh, smith or somebody uh, even if they took iron ore that ore actually originally comes from other stars all right now i want to uh, go to the uh, uh, the last part of my talk which is about uh, the interact human how it impacts life on earth so i would start with something very uh, simple uh so we have a uh, yeah i have shown a paddy field and the green paddy uh is growing because of uh the sun and water and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you know these three things are basic ingredients for what is known as uh, photosynthesis and that's how plants produce food and of course they produce food for their offsprings to survive but we of course steal from the plants to uh, serve for our survival so every life depends on another another life for survival 
Of course, this is from uh, this is a uh, paddy field from uh, Tanjavur, which is uh, you know fed by uh, the river Kaveri. But uh, in places like uh, Coimbatore and Kongunad, which is a dry place, you, you don't grow that much of paddy except in some pockets. And we mostly grow what is known as solum or kambu. So these are, of course, the same uh, process. Photosynthesis is uh, producing this food. Uh, by the way, I, I grew up in uh, Kungunad, Coimbatore, and uh, I ate all this uh, kambu and solam when I was growing up. That's very common. And then it got uh, into out of fashion. And now we are back to, uh, if you go to big uh, expensive grocery stores, you can find process to kambu and solam nowadays. And people have realized the importance of, uh, of these uh, grains, very important grains. And of course, to cook food, you need oil. And again, these uh, coconut uh, leaf, palm leaves, they, they do photosynthesis and, this, and store them food and, uh, and oil for us. And all these processes uh, is simply uh, due to photosynthesis in uh, chlorophylls of, uh, of leaves. And you can see the sun producing the uh, uh, light and then carbon dioxide taken from the atmosphere and then water uh, from the roots that go up to the leaves and then make the uh, carbohydrate in the leaves. So this is this is basically the life supported by by the by the sun. Now there's one interesting thing you should notice those people who are interested in climate and pollution that the photosynthesis actually clears the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. So that is one of the ingredients. So if you have more plants, more trees, uh, they sweep the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Of course, uh, you know, non-vegetarians, they don't care about uh, solam and kambu and, uh, you know, all this uh, vegetarian stuff. They can eat uh, goat and sheep. And of course, some people eat uh, beef and uh, you know all kinds of uh, animals. They eat rabbits. But uh, so why why how is sun affecting these things? Well, you see, they eat grass, and that grass is uh, growing by photosynthesis. So even the so first they eat the grass, and then uh, then people or even animals eat other animals. So you can ultimately see. Uh, the source of energy is again the sun. Well, if you go to uh, oil wells where we get uh, oil for our cars and uh, automobiles, that oil is energy. But that, if you, you know that 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 uh, oil or even coal, all these are again due to plants and uh, animal organisms that lived in millions of years ago. And those organisms, again, depended on the sun, whether it's plants or uh, planktons or whatever that produce this uh, oil and coal, they're again due to uh, photosynthesis that took place millions of years ago. Maybe the only thing that is different is the nuclear energy. Like if you have uranium, uh, use fission to produce uh, thermonuclear reactors, and that's definitely not from the sun. But that is only a small part, right, of the energy that we use. We have all kinds of energies. We have uh, solar panels. We have uh, solar energy in other forms used. We have windmills, wind energy, hydroelectric power. And this water actually comes from uh, higher uh, to lower levels because the sun heats the oceans, gets the uh, vapor up, and that becomes clouds, and the clouds pour rain, and the rain becomes a river. And we put a, a dam in the river and make a hydroelectric power. So ultimately, sun is responsible for that energy too. And even sun taught us how to make a fusion on Earth. We have still not uh, completely uh, completely uh, designed a reactor that produces uh, efficiently fusion energy, but in the future it's going to happen. 
but we do have but that is again uh, due to sun because so most of these fusion reactors they are based on hydrogen so uh, that is because of uh, uh, you know we have a lot of ocean we can get uh, hydrogen from the ocean and then and then do the fusion but uh, nuclear fuel uh, like uranium they are not from the sun as you know it it is from something similar to the iron story i talked about so because of this reason that it produces it gives energy and it provides us with food and fuel uh, the the light and heat from the sun is uh, it represents the bright side of the sun right so that's that's uh, we all know that and all the thing i talked about uh, the various cultures uh, praying the sun is god is all because of this benevolent nature but there is a dark side of the sun and that dark side is what causes problems to human technology in space it can even cause problems in polar regions <clears throat> because of what is known as geomagnetic storms when you have a lot of uh, material disturbances coming from the sun they can come and uh, hit earth's magnetosphere causing what is known as geomagnetic storm and this geomagnetic storm can produce currents that are flowing in pipelines and railroads and even uh, transmission lines they can be uh, disrupted generally it happens in uh, polar regions like uh, countries which are far north or south but uh, of course uh, some of them can affect uh, countries in the equatorial region also for example if you have a, a gps uh, receiver and that gps receiver can become disabled when you have solar disturbances arrive at earth so the the main two uh, aspects that uh, uh, that we need to consider or worry about is what is known as uh, solar wind and the solar wind is uh, basically charged gas that is ejected from the sun uh, with speeds up to 3 million kilometers per hour very fast and it is happening all the time uh, all around the sun and this is like a river flowing uh, all around the sun from the sun out into space sun also throws out huge chunks of charged gas with speeds up to 20 million km per hour or up to about 3000 km per second and these uh, charged gas contain a magnetic field inside them so this magnetized gas when it uh, propagates and interacts with the earth's magnetosphere they produce uh, what is known as geomagnetic storms also these chunks of gas they can drive shock waves in the interplanetary medium and these shock waves are capable of accelerating protons to giga electron volts and these electrons and protons they come and hit a spacecraft they can even reach earth's atmosphere and the some of the uh, energetic protons actually cause ozone depletion because they change the chemistry of earth's atmosphere uh by delivering their energy and breaking up molecules and producing radicals and these radicals interact with ozone and deplete the ozone so when uh, this kind of storms something like a, you know when you have a, a depression in the bay of bengal uh, you can actually get a big uh, storm or hurricane or you can get a tornado a lot of uh, disturbances can caused problems something similar to that in space the ejections from the sun cause disturbances and sometimes they can last for several days and the uh, often uh, affected uh, uh, people parties are air passengers in uh, in polar routes when you have an airplane flying closer to the north pole when you have a storm like this happens then you have all the charged particles uh, racing 
and coming and hitting the airplanes and producing secondaries. You might have heard about chain reaction. And they produce a lot of charged particles. And these charged particles can harm passengers and crew in an airplane. These disturbances can affect radio communication, satellites, astronauts, GPS receivers, satellite phones, electric power, oil pipelines, and even railroads. So this is the aspect that uh, scientists are uh, studying now, trying to find out when this uh, kind of storms, and people call them st solar storms, happen on the sun, and how long it takes for them to reach Earth. Typically, it takes about half a day to a few days. Uh, so uh, when we observe that something happening on the sun, then we can actually alert people, something like what uh, our um, uh, meteorologists tell about uh, rain and uh, you know uh, wind and stuff like that. And scientists are trying to make predictions when uh, these happen on the sun and how long it takes to affect Earth or other planets or other spacecraft in space. So here is an example of a, a storm. Yeah, you see a movie here. And you see the little uh, white circle in the center. That is the size of the sun. And then there is a blue disk around it, surrounding that. That is a, a disk that we put on a telescope to block the bright sun so we can see its atmosphere. And the atmosphere, you can see, is very highly structured. It is not a you know, smooth. Uh, uh, yellow sun you see surrounding you have a lot of uh, structures you see these uh, streaks these are called streamers and they are plasma sticking to magnetic fields and this plasma is at the temperature of uh, a couple of million degrees so the surrounding atmosphere of the sun called corona is structured by solar magnetic field and they contain plasma at temperature of a couple of million degrees. Now, that is the quiet time, but you can see disturbances when you have an explosion happening now. And you see the entire atmosphere is disturbed. There's a second one. And you see all these streaks uh, in the, it's like scratches in the images. These are basically charged particles accelerated by the uh, coronal mass ejection, the, the material that is ejected from the sun with speeds about uh, 3,000 kilometers per second. And these particles travel within about 11 minutes, just a little bit behind the light, which travels at, in you know, eight minutes. These are 11 minutes. And they hit the uh, spacecraft and the instrument, which is, uh, which is observing the sun and produce all these uh, charged particle secondaries that we see as streaks. So this is, uh, this is the kind of thing that is harmful to uh, our technology. And that's why we call this as a, as a uh, dark side of the sun or harmful side of the sun. And at the center of this uh, eruption I showed in the previous movie is actually, you can see it's happening on a, a bright region on the sun. And that bright region is called active region. It has a very high magnetic field. And this, because sun is ro rotating and also there is a convection going on in the uh, outer layer of the sun, these magnetic fields are twisted and turned. Sometimes they coil up just like a, you twist a rubber band or twist and twist. And finally, if you release it, it jumps. Similar thing happens with all this magnetic field twisted up and stores energy and explodes, producing these coronal mass ejections. These magnetized plasmas can weigh 100 billion tons. So uh, this heavy, uh, that's why they are called coronal mass ejection, because it comes from the corona. And uh, the important thing is not only the mass, also the magnetic field inside because the magnetic field is the one which interacts with Earth's magnetic field and uh, causes uh, all kinds of disturbances in Earth's atmosphere. And the bright thing you see on the sun after the explosion happens is called a solar flare, which is again magnetic field loops sitting on the sun with hot plasma. 
and they emit uh, excess radiation compared to normal times. And that is the excess uh, flare emission that we get. And these flare photons, they can come and again ionize the uh, Earth's uh, atmosphere along around about 100 kilometers from, uh, from the surface of Earth, a layer called ionosphere. And they change the conductivity of the ionosphere. Therefore, radio signals passing through this uh, disturbed plasma can be disturbed, sometimes completely lost. And that's how radio communication is affected. And they can also affect the GPS signal. Uh, as you know, uh, the refractive index of, uh, of the ionosphere changes, and therefore propagation of radio waves changes, and therefore GPS signals can be affected by, uh, by these uh, solar flares also. So remember, solar flares and coronal mass ejections, they happen uh, together. Uh, the flare is electromagnetic emission, whereas the coronal mass ejection is a mass emission, and therefore travels a little bit slower. It takes a couple of days to reach Earth compared to the electromagnetic radiation, which comes to Earth in eight minutes. And here is another mass ejection, which is, uh, which is going sideways. And uh, of course, the Earth is uh, towards the center of the sun. And uh, this is happening on the Western side. So this mass ejection is not going to affect Earth as a mass ejection, but the particles accelerated by the mass ejection, which you can see as the flickering streaks, they can come and even uh, hurt the spacecraft and astronauts. So these mass ejections are very important and you can actually Go to uh, you know online Google CME or coronal mass ejection, and you can see thousands of articles about uh, about these mass ejections. And for the past 20 years, these become very popular and uh, very important. And we understand uh, the disturbances to astronauts and space technology because we now understand these mass ejections. So these mass ejections uh, have speeds in the range. Uh, 100 to 4,000 kilometers per second. They have mass up to 100 billion tons. They have energy up to 10 to the 26 joules. Just note uh, this number, it's very big. One followed by 26 zeros. That's the amount of uh, joules that they put out in one event, like the one I've shown on the right. So you see how big it is compared to the sun, which is a little uh, white circle in the middle. And this mass ejection is, uh, many, 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 many times bigger than the sun itself. And that's, of course, it's a gas, gas made of uh, gas uh, threaded by magnetic field uh, lines. And these happen uh, at the rate of uh, one every other day or five times a day, depending upon uh, what kind of active regions are present on the sun. And they, they vary uh, with the time. For example, uh, the number of times it happens is uh, high uh, at certain periods and low at certain other periods. This is called solar maximum when you have a lot of uh, activity happens. And uh, also uh, more energetic events are ejected during uh, the solar maximum when you, have, uh, when you have a lot of active regions present on the sun. Of course, these uh, mass ejections are so huge, they can travel to the edge of the solar system. And they can even push the uh, boundary that uh, defines the edge of our solar system. You can see the orbits of all these planets. And these slowly moving things is the solar wind. And the big chunk that was moving and hitting the uh, edge is called a coronal mass ejection. So these are huge objects, and they can disturb not only Earth's magnetosphere, they can actually disturb the entire solar system, some of the big ones. And you can see when they reach, the, the edge becomes a little bigger. This is called a termination shock that uh, surrounds the uh, solar system. And uh, the size of that shock can increase when one of these mass ejections goes and hits those boundary. OK, so I mentioned some regions on the sun which produce these uh, mass ejections. And they are shown here. They, these are the sunspots. 
Uh, the sunspots are regions of high magnetic field. And this is the magnetic field I said, get twisted and uh, stores energy and then explodes. And this is, uh, this is what uh, in white light, you see these uh, sunspots. And then in extreme ultraviolet, when you see the corona, they look uh, bright because they have hot plasma in them. And you also see some other dark regions on the sun. And these are called coronal holes. And the coronal holes uh, also, uh, they are regions of uh, open magnetic field lines. And they have high magnetic field, but a different magnetic topology. And they are the ones which produce the high speed solar wind I mentioned before. So these two are the solar source regions. And you also see some uh, snake-like uh, structures above these coronal hole. These are uh, so-called solar filaments. These are cool material about 10,000 10, degrees compared to the million degrees of the corona. And these also explode sometimes. They also contain magnetic field and then produce mass ejections. And they can also be dangerous, but not as, as dangerous as the ones coming from the sunspot regions. So the reason I just called it dark side because observationally the, these uh, regions look dark. Of course, in some other uh, wavelengths, they can look bright also. So, but that's the, uh, just for a, a pun, I just put the dark side. Now, if you look at the same regions in a, in, in a magnetic field measurement, if the, this is the distribution of magnetic field in the sun, you see these same regions, they have, they have patches of high magnetic field. So the, the white portion is positive magnetic polarity, and the dark region is a negative uh, magnetic polarity. And you can see that the sun has uh, many such magnets sitting on it. So a magnet is not like a bar magnet that you have in your laboratory, but this is a magnet made of uh, gas and ga gas and in a moving plasma. But they have the same property. Of course, magnetic field is the same whether it is in a in a solid or in a liquid or in a gas. And these are the regions that are responsible. And the magnetic field contained in these regions, they possess the energy necessary to power these uh, solar wind and mass ejections. And you see this uh, one interesting thing in this uh, coronal hole region, the magnetic polarity is only one polarity. It's only positive polarity. It can also be negative polarity, but one polarity. It's called unipolar regions. And so the properties of uh, the magnetic field bipolar means the, the field line starts from the white portion and end up in the black portion. But here they start here and then go into space. So this, these magnetic regions are mainly responsible for producing those uh, uh, mass ejections and harmful energy that is directed into space. So uh, in, um, in 2002, uh, Japan uh, launched a spacecraft to uh, study the uh, Mars planet. And uh, the idea is to study the Mars so in the future you can uh, send the humans to Mars. And in, on April 21st, 2002, a big eruption took place. And you can see the intensity of energetic particles was uh, before the eruption, it was like uh, uh, this level. And when the eruption took place, charged particles increased. And uh, these charged particles actually destroyed the spacecraft on the way to uh, Mars. And the, the spacecraft's name in, Japan, in Japanese is Nozomi. And Nozo means hope, right? So this uh, big mass ejection from the sun made uh, the spacecraft actually hopeless. So that's, that's the, it's a loss of uh, several hundred million dollars. And it is caused by the mass ejection from the sun. That's why I call it dangerous. Of course, a solar storm doesn't care whether it's a Japanese or Indian or, uh, or American. And uh, the, in uh, 2003, 
one of the first big mass ejection I showed uh, during this talk. Uh, it happened in October 2003, and uh, it actually affected a, an instrument on uh, the Mars Odyssey spacecraft sent by NASA. And the instrument is called Marie. And the, the, uh, the purpose of the instrument is, again, to measure the radiation environment of Mars. So in the future, we can send astronauts to Mars. And uh, while measuring uh, the radiation, the big radiation coming from this big storm, uh, completely disabled that instrument. So again, a huge loss uh, for uh, human exploration. So uh, here is a picture showing uh, the sun and a cartoon showing uh, some mass ejection coming towards uh, Earth. And uh, here is Earth, and Earth is surrounded by the magnetosphere. And the red circle shows uh, the uh, geosynchronous orbit. And when ma these mass ejections come and hit the magnetosphere, they can push the, uh, the front side to the extent that the satellites sitting in the geosynchronous orbit can be exposed to space radiation, and they can be affected. OK. Now, these storms uh, happen uh, during, as I mentioned, during solar maximum. And during solar minimum, so this movie doesn't play. So in during solar minimum, you will not have these structures on the sun. It looks very plain. And during solar maximum, they come in uh, big numbers. That's why you have more ejections, powerful ejections coming from the sun. And this is the uh, variation which takes place every uh, 11 years. The sun becomes very active, and then the activity slows down. And again, another 11 years later, it becomes uh, again high. And uh, so here you see the difference between solar maximum and solar minimum. During solar maximum, you have many sunspot regions on the sun. Therefore, you expect more mass ejections. During solar minimum, you don't have any uh, sunspots on the sun. There may be some uh, other regions like the filaments I was talking about. Other than that, this is very active, not very active. So we can be safe saying that during solar minimum, we have less uh, danger. And during solar maximum, we have more danger. And again, you can see the same thing in the magnetic field. Uh, during solar maximum, you have lots of magnetic regions. And uh, during solar minimum, you have very tiny regions, which means very little energy is stored. OK, there's one other aspect of uh, uh, the sunspots. As I said, sunspots are dangerous regions. But the sunspots are surrounded by something called plage. And these regions of high magnetic field, but they do not have sunspots. And they, because they are bright, they produce excess radiation coming to Earth. Therefore, during solar maximum, the sunspot, uh, sunspots are trying to block the radiation, so you get less radiation. But the plages are increased radiation. The net effect is, during solar maximum, you have more energy coming from the sun. This was actually identified by uh, a, an astronomer by name Frederick Wilhelm Herschel in, in UK in the year 18, 1801. He found, he looked at uh, uh, the wheat prices in England, and then uh, he compared it with the presence of sunspots on the sun. So whenever you have low uh, activity on the sun, that means sun is kind of plain, the wheat prices were high. When the sun has more sunspots, the wheat prices were low. So at the time, people ridiculed him, uh, making this connection to wheat price and the sun. But actually, if you recall the photosynthesis I was talking about, you can immediately guess that during solar maximum, there is more radiation coming from the sun. Therefore, the wheat plants are happy, and they produce a lot of uh, uh, wheat. So the prices go down. Whereas during solar minimum, you have less photosynthesis. So there's less yield from uh, wheat. So the prices were high. 
So later on, it was found uh, that uh, Wilhelm was was uh, correct, but that's how science grows. You know, people punish scientists uh, when they think ahead of time, and later on they regret that they punished him, but then they are dead and gone. So things happen in uh, in uh, human endeavor like this. Uh, finally, uh, also I would like to mention about uh, sun climate connection. And uh, sun can, of course, affect the climate, but to a very small extent. Uh, the most of the uh, effect uh, happening on the sun, I mean, on the uh, global warming front is not by the sun, but because of the greenhouse gases that uh, human activities produce. And they go and uh, stay in the uh, atmosphere and they trap sunlight and therefore uh, sunlight and heat and therefore makes the uh, global warming possible. And it, this is, of course, a complicated issue. And uh, young people should uh, take up this and try to understand and then help the uh, planet. Because ultimately, if humans have to live on the planet, it has to remain at this temperature. If it uh, heats up too much, then we will lose a lot of uh, land mass uh, to the sea. And then uh, the, some places will become uh, not useful for agriculture and so on. So. This is a complicated problem that uh, young people should pay attention. Uh, so here is the uh, a chart from Stanford University. And increase in uh, temperature is com compared with increase in the uh, carbon dioxide content of the uh, atmosphere. And you can see a very clear uh, connection between when the temperature increases because the carbon dioxide uh, uh, is uh, is higher in the atmosphere. As I mentioned, it is it is a complicated issue. Uh, you know, I given a, a simple cartoon here. So uh, when I was growing up, uh, the uh, cows produced one or two liters uh, per day, maybe two liters in the morning, one liter in the evening. But now uh, cows produce uh, like twenty to thirty liters in a day. You know, of course, for that, they have to eat a lot. And uh, in, in producing 28 liters of milk, uh, they also put out 70 liters of dung. And uh, this dung, when it uh, decays, it produces methane gas, which again is a pollutant, which is a greenhouse gas. And also, these, uh, they eat a lot. And the burp, the, during burping also, they produce uh, um, uh, methane gas, and they go and uh, get uh, stored in the atmosphere and then become greenhouse gases and trap heat. So it is a it's a basically a, a compromise, and we have to find a careful solution to this problem because we do need milk, and this uh, population is very high, so we need more milk. Uh, but of course, we have to take care of uh, the more dung they produce and more burping they produce. So this is this is how the problem is complicated, and you know the simple ordinary star uh, can also lead to uh, you know other problems like uh, growing uh, grass uh, and then uh, and also affecting uh, producing heat, and that heat is interacting with human produced uh, uh, greenhouse gases, and ultimately it affects Earth's climate. OK, so you all know this. I don't have to tell you that uh, greenhouse uh, gases increase because of uh, automobiles. Anything that deals with, uh, uh, with carbon coming from uh, under the ground that was stored by previous plants. So that's, that's the problem. So you all know this. Uh, but how we can mitigate one uh, quick thing is, as I said, uh, uh, like uh, our uh, Indian president Abdul Kalam said that grow trees, and uh, because trees absorb carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis, they clean up the atmosphere. So plant as many trees as possible, and also go to energy uh, sectors that are less polluting, like wind and solar energy, and so on. So uh, to come to, to the summary of my talk, uh, you probably had some idea that uh, sun shines and life thrives on Earth. 
because we get food, food and fuel from the sun. Sun also has another phase, which affects life on Earth. And that is the, uh, uh, that is the hazardous phase of the sun because of the sunspot regions and coronal holes and filament regions. And scientists are trying to learn about the harmful uh, side of the sun and uh, trying to figure out when these storms start and how we can mitigate them. Uh, so these are the coronal mass ejection coronal holes on the sun. Audience, please wait. Hello, I have. Uh... Finished my talk. Did you did you hear or he did not hear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We we heard, sir. <laughs> Sometimes you can never know. I may be talking for an hour and then find out uh, nobody was able to hear. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your knowledge. Interest is most important thing in life. Happiness is temporary, but interest is continuous. I hope this will increase your interest in this astronomy webinar series. Over to you, Ritanya. Thank you, Ramni. We all got plenty of knowledge about the topic, but are saying more knowledge, more questions. So I think all of us must have abundant knowledge. So here we have Dr. D. Kanna and Vidya Bojan, Assistant Professors, Department of Applied Physics, who will read the questions of the guest speaker. Our guest speaker for the day, Professor Dr. Nath Gopal Swami, will answer the questions. So let's begin. Question and answer session. Thank you, Ritanya. Sir, we have a couple of questions. So, shall okay. I read the question? Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, the first question uh, is uh, about the process, what you told in the beginning. The bigger stars are uh, fusing more and more heavier elements to make iron. When the core starts making iron, does the star get near to its death? So that's a question. Which yeah, yeah. Basically, when the fuel is exhausted, that is the time uh, it's uh, closer to uh, its death, and it it explodes in the form of what is known as uh, you know supernova explosion, and all the outer shell is gone, and then we are left with the uh, the interior, and uh, that be eventually becomes a, a neutron star. Uh, or a black hole, depending upon the initial mass. But uh, all the uh, elements that are produced, they are exploded and uh, dumped into the uh, surrounding space. OK, sir. Uh, you were telling about the fate of the sun after some 5 billion years uh, from now. What mm -hmm. will happen to life on Earth if sun becomes a white dwarf after billions of years? Is survival possible on planet Earth? I think it is uh, on planet Earth. First of all, uh, you know there are, of course, uh, not conclusions, uh, conclusive uh, assertions on this. But uh, when the uh, when the sun becomes red giant, even become before become white dwarf, the sun will expand so big, uh, big that Earth will go inside the sun. So that means uh, you know it, it expands to Earth orbit. Uh, so that, that, that means that life on Earth may be difficult, <laughs> but we have five billion years left. So we can find another place in, uh, in, uh, in the universe, in maybe in uh, our own galaxy or, uh, you know, or even uh, people are working on a, a moon called Europa. And uh, they have a lot of water in Europa that is far away from, uh, from the sun. Maybe we can go there, but still... 
the important thing is the sun will lose its steam. So we do depend upon the uh, solar energy. And if that energy uh, is turned off, uh, life cannot survive. Unless there is some strange evolutionary aspect that life can survive, uh, change the current form or something like that. But I think the main thing is uh, the source of en energy is cut off, then life cannot survive. Good evening, sir. So the next question goes like this. Uh, we know that sun is a star. So is there any possibility of a star to turn to a planet when it cools down or when it's about to die? No, it will not uh, turn, uh, turn into a planet, but uh, you know, only three, uh, all, all observations and theory tells us that there are only three end phases of stars. Uh, so if stars like the sun, uh, similar mass will become a white dwarf, which is just like a junkyard will sit there, uh, you know, in, in space. And it's not a planet, but it will just sit there, sit there and the surrounding planets may uh, get disrupted. And if you have a bigger star, they become neutron star. And if you have more massive stars, they become a black hole. And uh, those, of course, uh, will be astronomical objects sitting in space. Thank you, sir. The next and there question. are many of them in, in the galaxy. The next question is like, can you talk about the space weather determination? Sorry? Space weather determination. Weather, weather in space. Space weather determination. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about uh, weather on Earth in terms of say wind or uh, rain or hurricane or, or you know something like that that is the that's because the atmosphere is neutral it has got certain number of uh, certain amount of uh, you know different gases but if you go beyond the atmosphere that space there you have different kind of situation there you have magnetic field there you have charged particles you don't have much neutral material so when you have charged particles then uh, the disturbances are a lot more complex because you can have electromagnetic interactions. You can have, uh, you know, waves that are not present in the atmosphere, like uh, a waves known as Uh, we have a question regarding the spectral classification of the sun. Uh, is our sun a giant star or a medium sized star? What is the color of the sun? It is red color or yellow color. What is the color of the sun? This is a question asked by uh, Mr. Lakshmana Prabhu. Professor, we are not able to hear you.
sir we are not able to hear you Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. It looks like uh, the questioner was uh, frozen for some time. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. Looks like we, yeah, we are back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is the spectral classification of the sun? That was the question I was asking. Color of the sun. Spectral classification of the sun. G. G. Okay, fine. This a G so star. the color of the sun is yellow. Yellow, yellow star, yeah. Right? Our sun is yeah. yeah. So the, here's Orange a question. Yellow, yeah. What plans do NASA have on how to manage the space debris? Well, it's uh, of course uh, NASA's policy is to mm, not to create uh, space debris, uh, and uh, this is a problem for the. Uh, United Nations of uh, United Nations Office of Outer Space uh, Affairs, and there's a committee known as UN uh, Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and through that organization, uh, there are uh, plans and methods to sweep uh, the existing debris and then reduce uh, uh, the debris that is put on the on on, uh, on the space orbits. Sir, so no most of the uh, most of the NASA uh, small satellites, for example, they are designed so that they can uh, either burn up before reaching uh, the surface of Earth. And there, for every uh, mission, we have what is known as a deorbit plan. And that way, uh, we don't increase the debris in space. And there are methods being devised to sweep up the space for debris. Okay, sir. Uh, how many generations of stars lived before our sun? Is it uh... well? I, it's 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 not completely uh, determined, but some people say up to several hundred generations. Because in in one billion there is you know there are, there are thousand millions, so anywhere from uh, you know one to thousand that range. So this is a common question from many students. Uh, they would just like to know, or they want you to share your experience on the career in astronomy, astrophysics, or solar kind of thing. Uh, well, it, it, you know, the simplest uh, answer is, uh, if you have interest in something, pursue it. You know, you basically, there's no, there's no substitute for hard work. You just, if you like something, you pursue it. And in my case, I, I did not plan to do astrophysics or solar physics. I wanted to do physics. And that's how I started. And then uh, you, uh, once you, you know, get the basic training up to PhD, so you do um, you know, a bachelor's, master's, and then do a PhD, at that time you're you are equipped, you're tool. You have uh, tools to do new problems. Then you can get into any problem you like. So, uh, but of course, if you start with uh, astrophysics and astronomy early on, you can make quicker progress. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a question asked by many students. How to become an astrophysicist 
how to choose <coughs> how, how to pursue a career in astronomy yeah so you, in india for example you have a lot of uh, universities offering uh, astronomy astrophysics courses you have really in fine institutes uh, that also give phd programs like indian institute of astrophysics ayuka and many iits indian institute of science my alma mater uh, so they have all very nice programs and the, the only way to get there is uh, doing hard work in what you are doing uh, so first you do whatever you are doing very well and then you know you pursue your interest so you have to of course uh, to take astronomy courses astrophysics courses uh, whenever they are available and uh, sometimes uh, you know you can do internship in some of these institutes you know you can do summer intern do a project uh, uh there there are a lot of people come to kodaikanal observatory to do projects and they pursue research in uh, uh in some of these astrophysics topics so you have to identify places where they give internship in case you know your uh, university where you are studying does not offer all the courses that you are looking for so there is a question on a space bro called parker parker space bro what is the main mission objectives of parker space bro so parker space probe is uh, is is called a missions to the mission to the star sun so normally we were generally sending you know spacecraft to all the planets uh and then into the outer space and the voyager actually has crossed the solar system and gone into the interstellar space but the parker solar probe was sent towards the sun and uh, to a region where the the this the atmosphere is or the surrounding is like 500 suns it's that much hot because as you go closer to the sun it become hotter and hotter right and so scientists wanted to study directly what is in that region so what is the again what is the magnetic field what's the temperature what's the speed of the plasma that is coming out what's the composition of the plasma so this is a direct in situ observations that is possible only to our star right because it is difficult to uh, go to other stars so if you want to study the closest to the star then we have to go closer to the star and that is the idea of uh, uh, the parker solar probe making in situ observations of uh, the solar surroundings so in situ you can do observation in two ways you know if you look at a galaxy uh, you do that through a telescope it is called remote sensing because you either use a photon or use a gamma ray or x ray uh you can observe uh, objects but you can never really see what's going on in the place where these photons are produced so in the case of sun it is possible that's why we have sent this uh, spacecraft closer to the sun so there's a question if there is there any possibility for space mining and if it is possible how to carry the mineral to the earth well right now uh, you know we have done mining already uh, as you know uh, we have brought to moon material in 1960s long time ago and uh, there is a is a recent uh, uh, esa effort to dig a comet and bring material to earth and similarly there is a nasa mission which has already taken material and it is on the way uh bringing but this is only for scientific purposes small quantity samples and uh if uh, you know again you know think about uh, what i said in the beginning in the solar system uh it is similar to earth in terms of uh, the composition of uh, you know heavier elements so if you want to do mining in a gaseous planet is very difficult so you have to look at the rocky planets and uh, we have to study the concentration and it is really worthwhile bringing some of these minerals from uh, say venus to earth uh, so you have to think about what is known as cost uh, and benefit analysis but from the moon yes it is not very difficult and we have already done it we we may have one last question sir 
uh, the question is all the stars have same composition do all stars have same composition well the the main material in more you know most stars is uh, is is hydrogen because the hydrogen is produced uh, in the big bang when after the big bang when uh, elementary particles combine to make matter the first one of course is uh, a proton capturing electrons uh, an electron around it to make the hydrogen so hydrogen is the most abundant in the universe therefore the stars will have that uh but uh, the future generation stars will have uh, you know different composition slightly different composition but it all depends what size of the cloud is collapsing to make a star okay if you have a, a sun like uh, you know collapse then you get a small star and it has got only a, you know mainly hydrogen but if you have a much larger chunk then you have other elements becoming higher quantity and that can lead to a uh, production of you know heavier elements even heavier elements but the but the wherever you go in the universe uh, mainly you see hydrogen and helium because that is what is produced from big bang so one last question is it possible to create a sun by artificial means if not what is the reason if yes why nobody has done that yet well uh, what do you mean by artificial sun you mean uh, in terms of hydrogen gas uh, fusion yes you can uh, you people have been trying to do that for a long time and i think uh, people uh, do have a fusion uh, demonstrated uh, in the lab only thing is you cannot uh, i mean sun size is uh, 700000 kilometers right and the earth uh, that is the radius of the sun and the earth's radius is 6000 kilometers a very tiny bit and how can you create a sun like thing on a much bigger uh, size we can only produce things which are the size of earth uh, radius right but we can do a uh, parts of it uh, what our processes that are taking place in the sun we can do uh, we can try to do fusion we can try to create a magnetic field and then you know there are places like in uh, in stanford university in caltech they have uh, plasma laboratories where you can simulate a plasma in a very smaller scale with a magnetic field and same processes which take place on the sun and in the surroundings can be demonstrated in the lab and there are some very interesting uh, laboratory experiments that are useful in studying the sun thank you sir for this healthy interaction and clearing all our doubts now khanna sir will inform us about the future programs over to you sir thank you ritanya so very quickly and very shortly i will uh, introduce about the future program so we had actually arranged uh, some six lectures in this international astronomy and astrophysics webinar series so far two are over the first talk was on the next generation planetary hunters today we had the talk on the sun so the third talk will be the dark side of the universe that will be next as uh, this coming thursday that is the dark side of the universe and the next uh, thursday that is on 8th of july we have again professor uh, dr e abenesh chellasami resident scientist at kodaikanal solar observatory and a fellow scientist of our uh, professor nath gobal sami coming and talking us about the sun again from a different perspective then the fifth talk will be uh, the future of radio astronomy by mahito shrey and he will be talking from taiwan national dunghua university and the final talk will be stars today we saw about the sun there are many other type of stars many participants have asked this question so we will be talking about the other type of stars in the coming days so this is for your kind information over to the mcs the powerful combination of two simple words
it's a specific acknowledgement that someone has done something mm-hmm. for you it's so easy to express your gratitude by saying thanks so i request ms mofia princey second year msc physics department of applied physics to deliver our gratitude ms please i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the oath of thanks on this memorable occasion let me first let me first of all start by giving glory to almighty god of making today's occasion a resounding success first and foremost i thank our special guest professor dr gopal swami who despite his busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion and i also express my heartfelt thanks for this valuable contribution thank you sir i would also like our i would also like to thank our management hachodi sir and all the faculties who had made this best arrangement for this program thank you all wholeheartedly i thank all the distinguished i thank all the distinguished invitees present here accepting our invitation lost but not least i thank you my friends for your cooperation in making this function resounding success finally i leave you this inspiring quote by dr apj abdul kalam failure will never take over me if my definition to success is strong enough once again i thank you all thank you princey for showing our gratitude if the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you as we get as we get ready to wind down the seminar i would like to invite ms carolyn second year msc physics department of physics to deliver the closing prayer carolyn please let us pray our dear loving heavenly father thank you for, thank you lord for the successful seminar we know that you have blessed us and this success may you keep blessing us as we go out of this venue and apply what we have learned in our own profession may you send your holy spirit so that we would we would have no fear in meeting the challenges that our everyday lives entail make us realize that without you we are nothing all these we pray and offer to you amen Thank you Carlin. Thank you everyone to be a part of this mega event. We we will meet you in the next event of this webinar series. Till then it's a goodbye from us. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank goodbye. You. Thank you everybody. Thank you Babal sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you sir. Thank you sir. Bye. Rajesh, you are at home. Yeah, I was just now. I returned back. <laughs> okay. Uh, morning, I had a simultaneous meetings. Okay. okay. From ten o'clock onwards, I have continuous meetings. <laughs>